All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rowan Newfeld. I'm the events coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. From this end, we're streaming live from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Plains Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota. Uh, Treaty 6 is also the homeland of the Métis Nation, one of Saskatchewan's founding peoples. Um, I'm so pleased you're all joining us tonight for the virtual launch of Dear Peter, Dear Ula by Barbara Nickel. And a uh, huge thanks, of course, to Barbara Nickel for being here tonight, as well as our In Conversation host, Pat Cooley, and special guest, um, Ian Hampton. I'd also like to extend our thanks to Thistledown Press for working uh, with us to put this event on. Before we begin, I have a couple of Zoom housekeeping items. We've enabled live auto captions tonight, which you can access by clicking the live transcript button along the bottom of your screen. Uh, please also feel free to submit questions for Barbara using the Q&A box, and we'll have some time uh, for those questions later in the evening. So I think at this point, I'd like to welcome uh, Carolyn Walker on screen. Uh, Carolyn's gonna make some introductions for the evening. Uh, she's the managing editor at Thistledown Press, as well as the former inventory manager at McNally Robinson Booksellers mm -hmm. in Saskatoon. So welcome, Carolyn Walker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan. And welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight for the official book launch of Barbara Nichols' new novel, Dear Peter, Dear Ola, with illustrations by Ian Hampton. I would, of course, like to thank Rowan and McNally Robinson Booksellers for hosting the event and for selling Barbara's book. And I also, of course, uh, have to thank our granting agencies that make all this possible, Sask Arts, uh, Canada Council for the Arts, and the Government of Canada for their publishing programs. I've done many introductions at McNally Robinson events, but uh, standing at the podium in the store as a member of the staff there, but uh, now for the first time in the publisher's role introducing our author and it's a thrill and all my years as a bookseller I was well aware of Barbara Nichols name and her reputation as the author of popular and award-winning books for young readers and so like everyone at Thistledown I was just thrilled that we had the opportunity to work with her on this new book. Barbara Nichol currently lives in British Columbia but she grew up here in Saskatchewan She's taught creative writing at the University of British Columbia, and she's published a number of books for children, including Hannah Waters and the Daughter of Johann Sebastian Bach, which won a BC Book Award and was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award. She also published a picture book called A Boy Ask the Wind, which was a finalist for the Ruth and Sylvia Schwartz Children's Book Award. Uh, she's also publishes uh, poetry for adults. Uh, currently, her work appears in the Best Canadian Poetry 2021 anthology and on the fabulous Poetry in Transit program out in BC where they have poems on buses. A fabulous idea. And overachiever that she is, she also has a new book out, a book of poems out this year with Caitlin Press called Essential Tremor. And uh, <clears throat> she's... Uh, living in Yarrow, BC, as I said, on the Storo territory of the Pilat and the Chilquayuk. And I'd also like to introduce Ian Hampton, her collaborator on the book, a friend of Barbara's who's a retired musician. He played in the London Symphony Orchestra before emigrating to Canada. And he's been principal cello in the Vancouver Symphony and the CBC Vancouver Radio Orchestra, and was cellist cellist of the Purcell String Quartet for 20 years. He published a memoir entitled Jan in 35 Pieces, which was edited by Barbara Nichol, published by the Porcupine's Quill. And the book was a finalist for the RBC Taylor Prize and the BC Book Prize in 2019. And Ian says he is spending his sunset years drawing, lucky for us. And the other person I'd like to introduce tonight is another friend of Barbara's, Pat Cooley, who's going to act as host for the discussion this evening. Pat Cooley is uh, taught high school English for 30 years. And after that long career, she spent the last 16 years as town librarian in Rossler in Saskatchewan. So you can see she's obviously a passionate uh, advocate of literacy and, and reading. And uh, she's, she's uh, 
been a friend of Barbara Nichols ever since Barbara was a student of hers, and I guess they've stayed in touch all these years. Um, Pat says that she's been a fan of Barbara's word choices ever since Barb edited the high school newspaper called The Borscht. And she says she's also very proud to introduce young readers to all Barbara's books, both her poetry and her prose. So welcome, Pat. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. This is, this is a great pleasure for me. Um, as a former teacher, when you have students who excel, it's, it, it's just wonderful. So I am really, really thrilled to be in conversation with Barb. This is like being at home, but not really. So the new book, this is a lovely, 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 lovely book. And I think when we first started, you were able to see the, the picture of it. So my first question, Barb, is how did this novel begin? There, can you hear me now? <laughs> Just turned off my, my mute there. Um, Right, so I have quite a, a long answer to that question, but before I get into it, I just want to say a few thank yous. I know there are just always so many thank yous and we want to get into the to the event, but um, before we begin, I'd just like to thank McNally Robinson um, and especially Rowan Neufeld for hosting and arranging. Um, thanks so much to the Thistledown publicist, June Lee, uh, for just the fantastic job he's done um, arranging these launches and promoting them. Um, Thanks to Carolyn and Liz and everyone at Thistledown. I just wanna give a shout out to Jennifer Lum, the designer and Celeste Colburn, um, the painter of the beautiful uh, cover. Um, it's been quite the journey and I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, I'm so grateful to my fantastic editor, uh, Ria Tregobov, who's in the audience tonight and we're gonna be talking about her later. Um, also the book's illustrator, Ian Hampton and he'll, he'll be coming on later too. Uh, thanks so much to you, Pat. For, for joining me here. I mean, how often do you get to have your, your high school English teacher and the Rothstein town librarian extraordinaire as conversation partners? So I'm so excited. Um, and then of course, all the people who helped me with this book, there are too many to list, um, but I, I'm, I'm really, really grateful. And as many of you know, I was supposed to be doing the in-person event at McNally tonight. I was supposed to be in Saskatoon, but you know, this way we actually, get to have more people in the audience um, than we would have. So um, thank you. Okay, now to answer your question, how did the novel begin? That was the question, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it began years and years ago um, when I was a student in the MFA program at UBC and I was trying to write an adult novel um, about my mom's father's family. Um, my grandpa Jansen came from the free city of Danzig or near there. Um, and I've always been fascinated with that um, area and with all my mom's stories about that area. Um, but there was a kid's novel seed in there too. Um, and so my mom who was born and raised in Tiefengrund uh, near Laird, Saskatchewan, um, always talked about her cousin, her first cousin, Ola, and how they were pen pals. So that's one seed. Um, and then there's this other seed, um, because my mom always told me about how Ola's birthday party um, was canceled because World War II had started and she lived in Danzig where it started. And her father, who was a city policeman, was in charge of making sure that everyone stayed in their basements that day. And so I kind of, you know, I always thought, hmm, maybe that's a picture book or something. And then I ran that idea by my professor at UBC, Sue Ann Alderson, who was a very wise woman. And she said, oh no, that's not a picture book, that's a novel. And then it's sort of, um, yeah, it was just always, I was holding this book for many, many years. It was just simmering on the back burner. Um, and then in about 2013, I attended the um, Seaside Writing Workshop in Nova Scotia with Kathy Stinson and Peter Carver. And in order to get in, I had to fill out this, app I had to do this application. And so it kind of forced me to get the first chapter done. And so I did, and that sort of kick-started it. And then with the encouragement of Peter and Kathy and the other writers at that workshop, I, I got, kind of got rolling on it. 
So that's kind of the long answer <laughs> to that question. Well, the, the format of the book has letters in it. And I think it's really, really important that we hear Ula's voice. So could you read something that will show us Ula's voice? Sure. Actually, would it be okay if I started off in Peter's voice? Yes. Yes. Because I Start with Peter. wanted to do the, is that all right, Pat? Yes, yeah. that would okay. be good. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'll just read something from the first chapter. Um, so yeah, it's, it's in Peter's uh, point of view. Um, and so yeah, there are letters and then there are also just like third person narratives. So this is in the third person narrative, but we'll get to the, I think we, we'll get to the letter later. Um, just to set up this reading briefly. Um, so Peter mentions his sister, Ripsy. And I should explain that Ripsy is a nickname. Her real name is Agatha. Um, but there's this German word, ribble rips, um, which is just an, a word for a child who really likes to wiggle. And so Ripsy is that child and ribble rips was shortened to Ripsy and that's her nickname. I think that's all you need to know um, for this chapter or this excerpt. Peter closes the door and sits down on the rickety piano bench with relief. He presses the scorch mark at middle C, feels the spot where some of the key melted. Ripsy again, even at the piano, he can't get away from her. A few years ago, she traded cookies to that English Johnny Wheeler in return for a firecracker. One Saturday afternoon, shut up alone in the living room to practice piano, she decided to press down middle C and stick in the firecracker. Peter can never figure out the next part. How did Ripsy even dare to dream up the idea of lighting it? He gets a sick feeling in his stomach, just picturing her creeping into the kitchen to steal the match from its holder on the wall. I thought if I lit it, I could pinch the fuse before it went off, she explained later in a perfectly calm voice to mama and father, as if lighting a firecracker in the piano is something a person does every day. Johnny told me I could. But Johnny must have been too busy munching cookies to tell her the fuse would burn her fingers. She had to pull them away and the firecracker kaboomed all over the living room, mama's china cabinet door rattling and one small vase inside it broken. Peter was hoping Bripsy would get a good licking for a change, that she might even be sent down to the creek to find her own switch. But she got away with a bare hand spanking. Injustice he whispers in English under his breath as he launches into his scales, giving the scorched middle C an extra hard accent. Injustice, he whispers again to get the pronunciation right. English to German, German to English. His Mennonite church and home are German. It's always been that way in Blumenfeld, a group of farms near the tiny village of Nesbit, where you can catch the train for Saskatoon early in the morning to return long after supper. Peter's been to the city of Saskatoon at least a hundred times in his head. Ulla had exclaimed over the name Blumenfeld, asked if it really was a field of flowers. Peter had written back, not really, unless you count scotch, thistle, and dandelions. Father was born in Danzig, mama here. Her great-great-grandparents came from Danzig too, but ages ago. They were searching for a place where they wouldn't have to fight in the war and could worship and farm in peace. Mama and father speak German, but school is in English and Peter tries out new words whenever he can. One time he asked mama, do I dream in English or German? She laughed and said, probably a bit of both. He switches to his Mozart sonata in time with the screen door slam. Father will take his time washing up. Then he'll turn on the radio for the news and Peter will have to stop. He drills the hard spot with the trill and thinks about Ulla. In her letters, she's a bit like Mozart's music. You never quite know what she's going to say next. But underneath all of her jokes and questions and underlining and exclamation marks and drawings is something quieter, like that first snowflake dipping its way down from the sky. What will she be writing to him today? Dumb cuff. Wake up, father snips his index finger against Peter's head. The world falls apart and here you sit with your music. Come now to the radio. We can't hear it with all your racket going on. Didn't you hear us 
shouting for you to stop. He pulls Peter to the kitchen where the whole family is huddled around the radio. They've started a war in Danzig, the Germans have, against Poland, Ripsy explains in that know-it-all voice of hers, trying to be a teacher, even though she's a whole year younger than him. They fired a shot from this battleship. That started it all. And aunt and uncle, Tante Trudy and Uncle Manfred and Ulla are right there. And where, what? Peter sinks into a chair. Dummkopf, how could he have been so caught up with Ulla and his music that he missed the sound of the radio? They're fighting at Westerplatte, says Margaret, her embroidery in her lap. What's Westerplatte? Peter wraps his arms around himself as if it could take away his clenching stomach. Quiet, roars father, crouching by the radio to turn up the volume, his head jammed up against the box. Peter wants to ask Mama, who's staring at father, fiddling with the dials to get a clearer sound, if Ulla heard the shooting, if she was hurt. A British voice says something about the parliament in session from 11 o'clock until 1.30 and deploying troops, then static, quiet. Father hits the radio with the heel of his hand. Mama takes his hand in hers. It will be okay, Hans. It probably won't amount to anything. And your sister and Manfred and Ulla, all of them will be fine. With Manfred and the police, and we all know his views on the Führer, he could easily get himself into trouble. Peter knows Führer means Germany's leader, Adolf Hitler. And even if Hitler isn't the leader of Danzig, he still has a lot of influence because Danzig is mostly German. For years, Ulla's father, their uncle Manfred, has been telling things to father in letters, like the night last year when the Germans smashed all the glass of the Jewish stores. Peter has seen father on Sunday afternoons reading and rereading uncle's letters and then sitting at his desk writing back. There. <laughs> so right at the very beginning, we jump right into some action and we see Peter and hear Peter, Peter's voice and his relationship with his family and how they are connected to this very vital thing that's happening in, in Europe. And it seems like it's they're all clustered around a radio and it just kind of comes to life from there. So my second question then has to do with one of your major your characters. You have two title characters, these cousins who share a birthday together and are pen pals. And so we are going to be able to hear an, an awful lot about their characters. But there is another character in your story, in your book, in your novel. And you have a picture of her. And her name is Irwina. Now, what does Irina and the picture bring to your novel? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I'm so glad, um, Pat, that you mentioned um, that photo of the character of Irina um, Berzachowska. Um, she's not a protagonist, but she's a really, really important character. And I'll show the photo in a minute. Um, because it represents a turning point in the process of my novel's becoming. Um, but to, um, yeah, so, okay. So I'll just explain about Arwina. <laughs> so I had this um, Wikipedia article um, about the battle of the Polish post office in Gdansk on the first day of World War II. And there was a footnote about the post office keeper's daughter Erwina, who was in the post office during the battle and was transported with severe burn injuries, um, it said in the Wikipedia article, to the Gestapo hospital. And sort of from that tiny little sentence of information, I created this character of Erwina, a plot line, and this relationship between Ola and Erwina. So then to continue on with the story though, um, long time passes, the novel was already accepted and due out with Thistledown in the fall. But like most manuscripts, it needed an editor, it needed an edit and a rewrite. And um, I was getting ready for this and I was responding to a question from someone on the Thistledown board 
um, and I'm forever grateful to that person <laughs> um, who asked some question about the language between Ola and Erwina, like, cause Erwina was Polish and Ola was German and um, sort of what language would they have spoken? So in the process of researching for this question, I came across an article about the battle of the Polish post office. And this article was written much, much later, like after my novel was finished, it was already in the hands of my agent. Um, and I just want to show the photo of Erwina that to my surprise, I came across. So here it is, hopefully I can get it. There it is. Um, so I was just shocked. I was delighted. Um, I started getting in contact, I found out that there was actually a Polish post office museum in Gdansk. And I became, you know, in email contact with one of the directors, and he provided me with this treasure trove of information about Erwina. And it completely changed character, plot line, um, relationship between Ulla and Erwina, setting um, because it turns out that Erwina and her aunt were actually in a civilian hospital. They weren't in the Gestapo hospital. That was an error on Wikipedia's part. Um, so in the meantime, though the manuscript was due, I had about three months um, to accomplish the biggest rewrite of my life. And that's the short version <laughs> of that story of Erwina. I, um... Irina is a picture, but a, a picture of a real life person. Mm -hmm. And I think that how wonderful that is for your readers that you see this picture. And then now you can imagine that Peter and Ula are real people too, because you see Irina. And the relationship that Irina and Ula have is a fast friend. They meet in a very, very interesting situation and they continue a friendship that then becomes even more real because we have this picture of Arena. Yeah. Would you like me to, should I, should I read a section that has Arena in it? I was hoping to do that. Yes, I would like you, I would, that was my next thing, is to ask you to read something so we see Irina and now we can hear her voice and we can really see that she is a real character. Please, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so just to set up this next excerpt really briefly, it's a letter from Ulla to Peter. Um, and in it, Ulla mentions Bernstein, which I should explain is a German word for amber. Um, which is found on the beaches of the Baltic Sea. Um, she also often begins her letters to Peter with a drawing. And so chapter eight, where I'll start reading, begins with this image of a grandfather clock. Dear Peter, September 15th, 1939. Tonight I write by candlelight. You're probably wondering why since we have electric lights, but candlelight helps me to think. I've drawn our grandfather clock to tell you the time. Peter, you won't believe this, but I've just tiptoed into the house. I am very relieved that I managed not to wake Mutti and Fati on the way out or back in. I am much too excited to sleep, so I will write and tell you everything. I've just visited Erwina in the hospital for the second time. I didn't write to you about the first visit, but I will write about this one and I'll tell you everything someday when we meet. Sister Scholl can only let me into the hospital on Thursdays at midnight. That's when she works the night shift. Because of the war, Erwina is restricted from having visitors. It's a secret that sister let me in. You must not tell your parents and especially not Ripsy. Now I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit in the chapter. My plan for leaving the house went smoothly. There I was riding along, enjoying the lights of the old city at night, having the sidewalk to myself once again, except for the odd smoochy couple out for a late night walk. Then I shivered in my sweater and realized I'd forgotten my warm jacket. 
And was that a dog or some thug ducking into that alley? I wondered if gangs of Hitler youth roamed the streets at night. Would they be looking for the girl who'd painted those letter boxes red? I've seen one or two of the boxes smashed and covered in ugly words. Fatih told me they're to be removed eventually. Remembering those mailboxes made me furious. I whipped along as fast as I could. Peter, I wish you could have been there. Night makes places new. I passed a swan in the Motlau River. A bit of moonlight from behind a cloud turned him into a lamp for a moment. Then he dove under the water and it was as if I hadn't seen him at all. Just some magic I might remember later. The great St. Mary's Church was an eerie monster in the dark and I was happy to ride by it quickly to find Sister Shoal's door. I stowed my bike by a tree and ran through some cold, wet grass. By now I was shivering with cold and hoping that Sister would be able to let me in. I glanced at Fati's watch, four minutes to midnight, and peeked through the door's glass square, searching for whatever sign Sister Shoal had left. I scanned the floor, stairs, the edges of the mat, nothing. Then I ran my thumb along my bracelets, Bernstein, for reassurance, and in that moment spotted what had to be the sign she'd promised. Sister's cross, with the tiny Bernstein in the middle, lying in the tufts of dust under the radiator. I hugged myself for relief and took out Fati's watch. Ten past midnight. And then Sister Shoal was there. I was so glad to see her smiling yellow teeth. She slowly bent down to pick up the cross and hang it around her neck, then opened the door. I'm sorry I'm late. There are always delays. It could be even longer next time, so be sure to bring a jacket, she whispered, rubbing warmth into my arm and ushering me down the hall. You don't have long, maybe 10 minutes. Remember to whisper. Erwina. I rushed in and took her hand. She looked tired, but smiled anyway with her mouth closed and mysterious, as if she were thinking about a secret. It reminded me of her photograph with Tutka the rabbit spying in the Tutka, and I smiled. Sister promised you'd come again, she rasped. Your bike was fast? Fastest in Danzig. She smiled again, and I wondered if she was thinking about our races. Uncle Jan? Hello, my dear, whispered Aunt Malgarzada from the bed over. We're so happy to see you. We realize it isn't easy. How did you sneak out? asked Erwina. I... Never mind that now, Erwina, we don't have much time. Did you find out about the Victoria Schule? Yes, I almost forgot to whisper. The Victoria School. I asked my Fati about it, he knows everything. Peter, I didn't want to tell them the next part, but I took a deep breath and carried on. It's a brick building at the end of Wood Street, right next to the Church of the Holy Trinity. Yes, asked Aunt Malgarzada. Somehow I knew she knew I was stalling. It's a private, very expensive school for young ladies. Fati told me they even have a soccer team. Can you imagine for girls? But that school has moved somewhere else for when it opens in October because, because, because what, asked Erwina. What I like about Erwina is that she doesn't beat around the bush, as you would say. And I knew that I had to say what I had to say and do it quickly. I pictured sister pacing on the other side of the door, keeping watch. Fati said it's now a prison. I could hardly force the word out. For at least a thousand doctors, priests, teachers, mostly Polish, I wanted to cry, but touched my bracelet instead. It seemed to help. I said, I'll go there and try to find Uncle Jan. First chance, I promise. Aunt Malgarzada was lying on her back with tears on her face. Her whole body was shaking. We thought so, said Erwina. There were rumors. There are probably teachers from my school, the postmen, any person we might know, and Uncle Jan. I could tell she was trying hard not to cry. Uncle Yan is like my Fati. That is an excerpt that is filled with all sorts of interesting and surprising and courage that this young lady has. 
but we really do see the character of both of those young girls who now have found, formed a friendship. So we have a very, very good picture of all of these. So then now we have some illustrations. And at this point, we'd like to talk to the illustrator and ask him about the drawings. So Ian. Hello. You, hello, Ian. You are not a 12 year old girl. Yeah. And yet, <laughs> And yes. yet your drawings are the, the musings of a 12-year-old girl. How did you get those drawings to be so true that we do believe that they are the drawings of a 12-year-old girl? <laughs> well, uh, well, I'm in my second childhood myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, so it's quite easy. <laughs> uh, and I know lots of 12-year-olds, but... Um, uh, well, I, I visualized the girl writing letters and that there would be an illustration at the top. Uh, mm -hmm. And so while my drawings were larger than what appear in the book, they were designed so that uh, they could be reduced and put uh, mm -hmm. at the he letter heading. Uh, I think uh, I, I spent a lot of time looking at old movies, silent movies, pictures of Danzig, Gdansk. Uh, and uh, well, I was five years old when war broke out and 10 years old when the war ended. And so later in the war, I certainly have memories of, of how it was in England <laughs> and, um, and the kind of atmosphere there was. And so, the photographs and the movies that I saw, uh, I thought were very moving um, uh, of an era which I have dim memories of, the, the kind of clothes which my mother used to wear and uh, my cousins and the long socks and <laughs> rather nice coats and this sort of thing. Um, yeah, so there was a great atmosphere which uh, I somehow got into uh, and uh, tried to replicate to some degree. We have, we have three uh, drawings that we'd like to show. Uh, one of them is the Hitler's Parade. Uh, Not up here. Uh, <laughs> yes. Can you tell us uh, the, uh, the impact that you think that that had as she watched this come down the street? Um, well, I think it must have been terrifying. <laughs> um, the drawing itself posed a bit of a problem because you want the image of Hitler, sort of, and just a little bit of the people that would be accompanying that car. And then the idea of crowds, Zeke Heiling, as it were, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which are not drawn accurately at all. But just to give an idea of a crowd and the vista of Danzig uh, mm -hmm. in a very small space. Uh, so the next... Clear. So... Uh, the next image is one of the images that I think is a very powerful one in the book, and that is the monster shadow. And uh, when uh, she pictures this, this is something that she sees being cast. And yet when she turns around, it is really just the shadow of young boys who are up on top of the roof. But you have created a monster shadow that... Uh, continues to be an image in, in the story. How do you see that as a uh, part of her thinking and trying to understand what's going on in the world around her? I think that she would f f thought of it very threatening. Uh, and I've tried to suggest in a rough way uh, uh, a reflection of the boy's image on the left <laughs> and with 
the threatening shadow, which suggests somebody might, that might be hung and somebody that might be jeering or, th or threatening uh, below the, the, that, the two figures. And then the, the problem of uh, doing uh, ink on paper and then smudging it slightly with pencil to suggest shadow. Uh, and of course, it's not really realistic because if you notice on the vista beyond, uh, there are no shadows, but that's mm -hmm. a 12 year old. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I think that is a very, very powerful image because as, as the story progresses, you know, the world around her changes. It's not the world that she was quite familiar with. And so that monster shadow, I think has become very, very powerful. Um, the other one that we want to take a look at is uh, the front piece, the grain elevator and the, uh, the counter. Uh, when you first look at they look as if they're two totally different things, but there are many similarities. And the similarities in those that help us to understand the two worlds of Danzig and Saskatchewan. So can you explain a little bit more about those two images? Um. Well, the Krantel is a very famous landmark. And um, I, I found an old photograph of the old building. I think it was damaged or destroyed during the war. I'm, I, I'm not quite sure what the extent of the damage uh, or completely rebuilt. But the old photograph is just a wonderful building. It, uh, and the drawing, it can't possibly uh, convey all the nooks and crannies of that building. It's quite, quite fascinating. And, it, and uh, as it stands sort of on, on the harbour, and uh, it's, it's very, very picturesque. The grain elevator, of course, is a very familiar scene to us all. <laughs> um, and, and of course it has similarities. It's very, very tall and it's thin at the top. Uh, and again, a lovely wooden building. There's the, uh, I tried to find an old one, uh, which is almost abandoned. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they're very, very similar. Uh, we have, we are starting to have fewer and fewer of our grain elements uh, around here. So it was wonderful to have as we opened the novel to see that, that there is a visual connection of both of those worlds, two images that are very important to the two characters. And then it was a constant reminder to us that even though they are from different countries, they are the same age, they share the same birthday, that they have images that will define them and also images that have similarities in them. They are very, very wonderfully drawn. And as a 12 year old, they've captured what we think or what we would think that a 12 year old girl would think is an important part of each of these images. So can you just kind of go through the experience that you had of being able to draw these pictures for Barb? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm grateful for Barb to give me the chance. It was a challenge for me. And, uh, and of course, I read the narrative and, uh, and Barb had made a number of suggestions for pictures. And uh, I don't know how many drawings I've done, about 25, I suppose, for this book, all in all. Uh, uh, and, um, well, the, 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 the journey through Barb's story and then the locales, which one I could see in photographs and in old uh, silent movies and this sort of thing. Uh, a very powerful atmosphere. Um, the, the one drawing which gave me the most trouble was with the one of the battleship that Bob mentioned in chapter <laughs> one. Uh, a monstrous boat, <laughs> just monstrous and almost impossible to draw. But then anyway, uh, so, there are, there are a few glitches like that. I did a few close-ups of Hitler, which are, of course are quite easy to do, quite cartoonish. But again, uh, Barbara wanted Hitler to be seen in the parade as being rather small. 
small-minded, small man. Uh, I hope that answers it. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So we, uh, the illustrations in the book are, are ones that will help us create that picture of these two young people navigating some history. But thank you very much. They are they're wonderful drawings. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Ian, for, for collaborating with me on this. It was just such a gift um, in the final stages of this novel to have these, these drawings. Oh, it was great fun. I... <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. One of the things that comes out in uh, the novel and the middle grade readers or the audience that you are speaking to is that there are many, many themes that come out of this novel. And I was wondering if you'd like to expound on some of the themes that you think are really important that young people will take after reading the narrative of Irwina, who is a real character, and the two fictional characters of the cousins. Sure. Um, you know, some of the, I mean, there are a lot of different themes. Um, one is that you have these cousins at a major um, time in history, and um, they're trying to find their identity and trying to see where their allegiances um, lie. And um, what is a friend and who is an enemy and what is the right thing to do? And I can't really talk about those themes um, in the novel without mentioning my wonderful editor, Ria Tregobov. Um, so, cause Ria with her, her Jewish um, family background and identity, she came to this novel with um, about Mennonites and Germans living in World War II with a whole new set of questions that I had never been asked before. And she really pushed me to write my characters out of the places um, where they were perhaps hiding um, in neutrality and kind of like, this is the way it was, this is the family story. And they just sort of um, were able to take a stand and become characters in their own right. Um, not necessarily on bloodlines um, or family lines where their loyalties might be expected to lie. For example, Peter and Ola are first cousins. And yet then when World War II starts, um, one as a German and one as a Canadian in the eyes of the world are enemies. Um, Peter is bullied by a Mennonite boy, one of his own people. Um, Ola becomes a close friend to Erwina, who as a Polish living in Danzig was certainly the expected enemy. And so I found I had to write, ride this line of telling it how it really happened in my family and actually creating a fictional character who could make a choice within a certain context. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I'd like, like to ask you a specific question about Peter. Mm -hmm. Peter as a young boy is a very, very talented musician and yet, he's in his own world because not everybody around him understands that. You are a very talented musician. How much of Peter is you? Oh, <laughs> that's such a good question for kind of the lead into the, the last excerpt that I'd like to read. And maybe I can just answer that question by telling. Again, I, I wanna bring Rhea into this because um, there's a, a chapter in the novel um, where Peter goes to Saskatoon to take a very advanced piano exam. And in the previous version, it was a very dark chapter. It was filled with anxiety and fear, not a very fun day for Peter and kind of like the way it would have been for me <laughs> going into Saskatoon to take a music exam. And then Rhea, you know, she just kind of said, you know, Peter has a lot on his plate. He seems, you know, what can we do about that? And I was saying, well, maybe we should take out the exam 
maybe that would be a, a good way to sort of lighten his load. And she goes, no, you don't have to do that, but you just make it not so fraught, right? And so then I, it just, that just opened up a whole world for me. Peter doesn't have to be me. <laughs> you know, the, the trip to Saskatoon could be an adventure. He could not have any nerves about his exam. And it actually became really identity forming for Peter. Um, so would it be okay if I actually yes. read, finished off with that reading of the yes. exam chapter in Saskatoon, which I thought the Saskatchewanites in the audience would really enjoy this. Um, I had so much fun rewriting it. Um, so here it is. And this is from the chapter called Saskatoon. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything that I need to say to set it up. So here it is. If Bruno and Henry could see him now, rolling down this avenue in a streetcar like a king. Mama, he whispers again, sitting forward and craning his neck to see past the driver. Is that a castle at the end? Oh, she looks down at her paper. That's the big hotel. Elise told me about it, the Besbro. The newspaper man looks over at her and Peter wishes Mama would soften her voice a little. At least she's speaking in English. Father had given strict instructions. Elise told me to get off near it. The stop just before. Maybe we should get off now? Peter shrugs his shoulders and looks at the fancy hotel. It seems pretty close, but it's hard to tell. At the next stop, Mama stands up and takes his arm and they rush off. Peter jumps off the step. He just wants to make sure he hits the ground before the streetcar starts moving again. I hope that was the right stop. I suppose I should have asked, says Mama, once they're walking down the sidewalk towards the hotel. She stops to take Father's pocket watch out of her purse to check the time and smiles at Peter. Well, at least we're not going to be late. Block after block, and they still haven't reached the hotel, but Peter doesn't care. Walking is even better than the streetcar. He looks in store windows and walks right past a man with a pipe. With each block, Peter glimpses more of the hotel rounded turrets on the sides like a fairy tale and how many windows it's made of orange brick when they're finally standing across the street from it peter has to crane his neck and squint to see the small turret like a treasure at the very top who gets to sleep up there if only he could take this hotel back to blumenfeld for show and tell and then behind it could it be a river with mist rising and all the trees iced with frost. Will Saskatoon never stop handing out surprises? It's like Christmas, but better. Mama's turning left, looking at Tante Elise's directions. Mama, says Peter, could we walk on the other side closer to the river? I don't see the harm in it, says Mama, and takes his hand across the street. Peter, let's go. Mama, I'm 12, not Katie's age. When they finally step inside the church, the assistant at the table informs them that they're an hour early. Didn't you read the information sheet, she asks, faster and more clipped even than Mrs. C. It says to arrive 15 minutes ahead, she taps her nails on the table. But, but, the train early, the streetcar. Even though Mama's English is good, she fumbles her words and asks Peter in German to ask if they're allowed to eat their lunch in the lobby. Mama goes to find a seat and he mumbles the question, his cheeks burning with thaw and embarrassment. I suppose so, the assistant says with a little smirk. Just tell your mother not to spill the milk. Peter makes sure he doesn't tell Mama anything. She'd be so mad she might storm off and never come back. He hides the milk bottle under a tea towel in the lunch basket so the assistant can't see. Peter tries to practice on his lap, but the assistant at the table keeps glaring at him. Or maybe she's mad at Mama for darning. The clock on the wall almost keeps time to his Bach invention. From down the dark hallway come the sounds of a student fumbling through a Mozart minuet, playing a wrong note every second bar, as bad as Ripsy. Mama hands him a farmer sausage bun. He devours two with pickles and milk and another square of puffed wheat cake. He's practicing each piece in his head when the assistant calls his name and leads him down the dark, darkened hallway to the exam room. Then more waiting on a chair outside the door, he rubs his hands together. When will it ever be his turn? Now that we're, we're a little sh short of time, so I'm just gonna skip ahead. So he goes through the exam and it, it actually goes very, very well. And then this is just at the, at the end of the exam. 
Bravo, says Herr Bushybeard. That's the examiner. Normally I would stop a student part way through a piece, but I needed to hear you to the end. I'm going to tell my university students about your ending to the Chopin. Such a unique interpretation. Just that smidgen of extra time before the theme to the end. Did your teacher show you that? No, it's just, just how I like it, says Peter, thinking about the scorch mark. Herr Bushy checks his watch and stands up. Come, I'll walk with you to the lobby. He asks Peter how old he is and how much he practices and if he's played this piece or that. When they reach the lobby, he tells Peter he'd like to talk to Mama. But Professor Crane, says the assistant, looking at her watch and jumping up from the table to trail after him. We're running almost 20 minutes behind and the other students. They can wait, he says, and walks over to Mama who is putting away her darning mushroom. Peter asks the assistant if he can use the washroom. She smiles and nods to a door leading to another hallway. I heard your music she says, offering him a peppermint. It was so beautiful. Thank you for the concert. Peter says thank you and heads for the inside washroom. He opens the door. Saskatoon can't possibly get any better. He runs his hand over the smooth, cool surface of a flush toilet. What a wonderful way to end the, the, the brilliance of him thinking that this is, this is fantastic. I think we have a little bit of time for some questions. Are there some questions that people would like to ask? No questions. <laughs> oh. Well, well, Barb. Sure. <laughs> this is such a wonderful book. I, I think that one of the things that after I was reading, I was thinking, what a great family chapter book this would make. You know, you know the concept of a chapter book. And where you would have one family member read one chapter in, in Peter's voice and another chapter. I think it would just be a wonderful family book. You were concerned about that it's a thick book, but it is so filled with uh, descriptions that these characters walk right out into our living rooms with us. So it is, you have created three very, very wonderful characters. One, who we just have a picture of, but you have fleshed out her her character so well, and two that apparently are fictional, but I think there's a lot of each one of them in you. Thank you. Oh, I see, Pat, we have a question. Okay. In the Q&A box there. Uh, what was your most exciting challenge in writing this? Oh, this is well. This from Allison. Thanks, Allison, for that question. <laughs> well, as I said, when I described that rewrite, um, that was the most exciting challenge when I came across all that new information and had to completely rewrite most of the dance sections from scratch. At the same time, Ria was pushing me in a really good way with all these major questions. Um, and so I just had a lot of like this huge rewrite and that was, the biggest, biggest challenge in, in writing it. Uh, Pam has asked a question, Pam Booker. She said, what age or grade level do you think that your novel is most suited for? So I feel that this is, um, it's a middle grade novel. So sort of grade four to six, like usually kids like to read up. So the, the protagonists are 12 years old. So, you know, that age group for grade four to six would be good for it. But I'm thinking with the content, the historical content, and there's some pretty serious stuff. I think older <laughs> kids would enjoy it, you know, as well. I, I agree. I think that it, it stretches more than just the 12. Uh, I think for the upper end, the historical aspect and what it would be like as a child to grow up in that era. 
those are the things that I think young people are looking for when they're trying to figure out a sense of identity themselves. If they can see themselves in other people or other young people like them who are going through trying times and having to make very, very important decisions in what is a friend or what is really important in life, what are you, what are you really dedicated to? Uh, this would spark lots of lots of discussions. It's there's a question from uh, Francis. Oh, I guess that one's cool. something about the book being available. And yes. yeah, just to let Francis know, I just received my copy on Monday, so it's just getting out into the world. <laughs> and I just got mine today, so. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Barb. I'm, I thought this was a really, really exciting time and I was very, very happy to have had this opportunity. One of the last questions that from Denise, has asked, have you ever visited Danzig in Poland? Ah, you... yes, I did. I did visit Danzig um, back, way back in 1994. And I really, really wish that I had, I actually visited with Ulla and Clemens, her husband um, and my parents who actually, I didn't get a chance during in, in the conversation earlier to say how much my parents helped me with this novel. All of the research from the Peter side, they just, I couldn't have done it without them and other many other family members as well. But yes, with, with Ola, my mom's cousin, we actually visited together, um, visited Poland and, and saw where my um, grandfather had grown up. Um, Kieran has asked a question. He said he liked that you use the lost art of writing in this novel. Has this inspired you to write more letters or do you think that this will have an effect on your on readers by using that format? <laughs> well, that's such a great question. You know, I've often thought in, in and actually I was just listening to a, a radio program on that this afternoon, um, you know, in all of our correspondence now with all of it being an email, you know, how is that going to last? Um, you can just press a delete button and it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, letter writing is really, really important to me. And, you know, I, as a, as a writer, I've gotten so much research material. Like when I wrote The Secret Wish of Nanaro Mozart, I mean, so many of my details I got from letters. And so, yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm keen on, on letter writing and I don't know if it'll It'll inspire me to do to write more letters. Actually, Thistledown made a bunch of postcards to go with this this book. So I think I'm going to be doing a lot of postcard writing, maybe not letter writing. <laughs> I think that that um, oh, there was one. Is there another one? Yes, from Ria, my editor. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk about the back <laughs> matter? Back oh, matter. Yeah. Livia, thank you so much for asking that. Yes, I am so excited about the back matter in this book because I did it as a series of PSs. So like you've got the author's note, which is the first PS and it includes a, a map of the city of Danzig. I was so excited when I came across that map. And then you have the PPS, which is this portrait of Erwina, which we showed you earlier. And then you have PPPS, which is a recipe for apple charlotka, which is a recipe from Erwina's family that we read about in the novel. Um, and for any of you who are planning to attend my in-person launch in Abbotsford, it, apple charlotka will be served. And then you have a section PPPPS, which is about Mennonites. So it gives some background about Mennonites and includes an etching of the Dirk Willems story, which becomes important in the novel and also a recipe for pepper nuts, which will also be served at the in-person <laughs> launch. And then finally, the last five Ps and an S, I'm not going to say what that is. It's a very important thing, um, but it has to do with the narrative of the novel and I don't wanna spoil it. <laughs> but thank you so much Rhea for, for talking about that. OK, 
Okay, is this? <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. I'm crashing the party. <laughs> okay, no, that's good. That's good. There, there was, there was the the question in there that is the universal question: Are the pepper nuts soft or crunchy? Which is an unanswerable question, correct? They're definitely going to be. Well, we'll see. I think crunchy. <laughs> Crunchy is the right answer. <laughs> um, well, thank you both so much. Um, Barbara, did, maybe I'll pass it back to you just briefly here before I uh, tell people how they can buy the book. Sorry, just for the thank yous. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so just I said most of my thank yous at the beginning. Um, but yeah, I just want to say again, thank you so much to everyone. I'm extremely grateful. I'm thrilled with this book. It's been a really, really, really long time coming, a long journey. And I'm just, I'm grateful to everyone. And also just for everyone who helped with this launch too. You did an, an ex exceptionally good job of being able to create these characters, Barb. They, it's, it's, it's a wonderful book. Thanks. Well, thank you both so much again. Um, obviously a huge thank you to Barbara Nickel for being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you to our guest host, Pat Cooley, as well as our guests, Ian Hampton, uh, as well as Carolyn Walker and Jen Lee and all of the, all tongue tied, all of the folks at Thistledown Press. Um, thanks so much for working with us on this event and to everyone who joined us tonight. So. We, I can confirm we have the books in the store um, in Saskatoon. So we would, of course, encourage you all to purchase a copy of Dear Peter, De Dear Ulla from uh, McNally Robinson, either online at McNallyRobinson.com or in store. Or if you're not in Saskatoon, find your local indie bookstore and order the book from them. Um, so again, we appreciate your support so much and really look forward to being able to safely host events in person again. But until then, uh, please keep an eye on our upcoming events page to find out more about our virtual offerings. And good night. Stay, stay safe. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.